Hello everybody! Welcome back to Creeps and Creeps. My name is Cece Delaney and today we have a hefty boy. We're gonna be here for a minute. It's the Chris Watts case. If you don't know about that case, oh good god buckle in. A lot of the information that I was able to find is just from Shanann's Facebook page or texts that were available after the 2000 page discovery. It's definitely going to be a long one. So grab a snack, grab a friend, grab a blankie. I don't care. Just grab something and hunker down because yeah, we're about to become really well acquainted. Before we get into it, I would just like to ask that if by the end of this video you decide that you like what you're hearing, feel free to hit that subscribe button. We'll be here twice a week for you, except for last week, but that's okay. We're going to keep it moving. Otherwise, uh, leave a rating if you're listening on the podcast. Leave a comment. Um, I think that's pretty much all I feel like plugging today, so let's just get into it. Mr. Christopher Lee Waltz was born May 16th, 1985 in Spring Lake, North Carolina, and he was generally described as a fairly quiet guy. He didn't really date a lot, but the one girlfriend who did go on record for him was like, um, yeah, he was like a gym rat, but that was in high school. Like, that was kind of his defining character trait was he quiet, he gym rat. There's really not a lot of depth to this man, as it turns out. So with that, we're just going to keep it moving into Shanann. So Shanann Ruzak was born January 10th, 1984 in Passac County, New Jersey, but she grew up closer to where Chris was in the North Carolina, Moore County area. She had a lot more praise put upon her. So she was one of those people who was very well liked. She added that glow to the room, you know, she enters and everyone's like, there's a shift in the energy. Who's that? They look over and it's Shanann and her bubbly little personality. So she was very much one of those people. But she also had a very strong headed nature to her. She definitely knew what she wanted. And come hell or high water, she was getting it. I was never the smartest kid on the block. I worked my tail off to um, fight through school. I was the one staying up to two o'clock in the morning studying and still struggling. I'm a horrible test taker, horrible test taker. I can know all the answers, but put that test in front of me and I bomb it or um, I struggle. And uh, I've always struggled, um, you know, through school. I've always, um, a lot of things like insecurities, all of it played. I think he played a huge role in my, my, um, everything. So, but then the thing about me that is different than, than just different about me is, um, things that could have knocked somebody down completely hardcore. Um, but the thing is, is I believe that everything in life happens for a reason and I also believe people are placed in our life for a reason and I remember when I went through um, something major in my life I you know good relationship um, gone bad and uh, I remember coming out feeling the weakest I've ever felt in my life like I was no good I wasn't good enough Um, my insecurities got deeper stronger um, and I felt like I was not worthy of anything I guess that personality kind of did help or maybe was actually created because she suffered from two extremely difficult to deal with autoimmune disorders. So she suffered with both lupus and diabetes. I don't know how much about either of those that you know, but uh, neither is great. And especially lupus, that's one of those more invisible diseases that a lot of people will talk about. She would be like, dude, I'm so tired today. I stayed up too late or I worked out a little too hard or whatever and people are like god shenan you're just being a baby she's like okay well no i'm not but thank you so from what it seemed like on a lot of her social media posts about the topic she seemed a little frustrated that people were like stop being a little bitch in honor of world lupus day i wanted to share with you guys a little bit about myself so over 10 years ago i started um, losing a lot of my hair i started um, having a lot of body aches a lot of discomforts in my body, a lot of things that were um, limiting my everyday um, living. Seven years ago, um, 2010, I went from me being a size six, which was about 135 pounds for me, to going to a size one slash zero, which was a good 20 pounds that I lost. 
And with losing all that weight in a matter of, a, I would say, three to four week period, I was also feeling extremely terrible um, to the point where I did not want to get out of bed, literally didn't get out of bed for days. I finally drug myself to the doctor's office and made them um, do all kinds of tests. Um, I wanted to know what was wrong with me. A part of me was changing. I went from being super energetic, super happy, just an all around happy person. I loved going out and doing things. I loved getting together with friends. I loved, I mean, I loved working. That sounds crazy, right? Fast forward about two weeks, which was the first week of May of 2010 when they diagnosed me with lupus. So fast forward several months. During those several months, I saw multiple, multiple rheumatologists, all of them telling me I had lupus, and then finally being diagnosed also with fibromyalgia, which is another autoimmune disease. So. I completely lost it. I wasn't feeling good. I felt like I had the flu all the time. I felt miserable. Um, I was put on all these medications, which then made me gain weight. I also met several friends through the Lupus Foundation. Um, I met support from support groups, uh, Lyme disease support groups, um, lupus, uh, fibromyalgia, all of them. I met some of my best friends today from those groups. And I don't think, like I know I couldn't be where I'm at right now without a lot of them um, who stuck by me, who supported me, who understood what I was going through and never left my side. And I went through one of the, I would say, darkest times of my life because things just got scarier, um, worse. Um, I thought my life was crumbling underneath me and I didn't know uh, which way to turn. Uh, I didn't have a lot of friends at the time because a lot of my friends, um, the friends I did have I lost because they didn't understand that I looked perfectly fine and I felt perf uh, horribly inside, um, horribly. I felt um, a lot of discomforts, a lot of aches, a lot of um, bad moods. So she was just kind of one of those headstrong people that were like, okay, well, you don't have to believe me. I know it's true. So you can just like suck my left tit and get out of here. Around 2003, when she was just 19, she married a man named Leonard King that she had met in high school. The marriage didn't last very long. It only really kept it moving until about 2007. But the reason I bring this up is because she kind of showed a lot about her personality through him. Like, he was a very dedicated husband and she was a very dedicated wife. They got married for all the right reasons. It just, you know incompatible. So something that he really talked about and expressed later in interviews is that Shanann was not an argumentative woman. She was kind of one of those ladies where she would get mad and then she would shut down. She would go to the other room or in this case, she would really, really just shove herself into her work. So by the time they were divorced in 2007, she had managed to be able to buy her own big ass house in North Carolina. But I remember when um, I was single for a long time and my goal was to buy a house. I was tired of paying someone else's mortgage because you know, that's what you do when you rent. And I wanted to buy a house and I wanted to buy a house that I could resell um, one day and make a profit off of. And so I worked and worked and worked and worked. I lost a lot of friends because um, a lot of my friends were still young. We were still young. And I was 25 years old when I built my first house. Um, my family doesn't come from money. Uh, we always worked hard for what we had. And I did, I bought my first house at 25 years old. And that was the biggest accomplishment I felt I've ever done because I did it by myself. So fast forwarding about three years in 2010, Chris and Shanann meet in their home state of North Carolina. My friend sent me a friend suggestion for him. It was actually his cousin's wife and um, I deleted it. I had no interest in dating anyone. I wasn't looking for a boyfriend. I was working, I was goal oriented, I was a dreamer. I have always been a dreamer. I've always wanted everything in life to be perfect. Um, so anyway, fast forward, in a dark place, all of a sudden I get a friend request from Chris. I said, what the heck, I'll never meet him. He's just a Facebook friend, I have a million of them. Nothing's gonna come of it. Well, two weeks later, we finally meet on a blind date. From there, I couldn't get rid of him. I tried, he wouldn't go away. He was stuck. Uh, I drug him to a colonoscopy. I drug him to rheumatology appointment after rheumatology appointment. I drug him to my spinal tap, which was awful. Um, a student did it, which I'm all for people learning, but not when it comes to a spinal tap. <laughs> With my diagnosis of lupus and fibromyalgia all within a six month period, I lost my grandfather, just closed on my house. I had a lot going on. 
Um, emotionally, I was all over the place. I felt awful. Um, canceled dates left and right with Chris because I just couldn't do it all. Well, one thing led to another and eight years later, we have two kids. We live in Colorado and he's the best thing that has ever happened to me. And because of my health challenges, because I got so sick, I let him in and he only knew me at that time. He knew me at my worst and he accepted me. And you know, through um, your vows, like through sickness and everything, he's been there. He was the one that let me lay on him and fall asleep for three and a half hours on his lap while he had to pee. Um, he is the best thing that has ever, ever happened to me. After that fairly tumultuous start to their relationship, they got married November 3rd, 2012, and actually faced a few fair more uh, obstacles, one could say. For example, Chris's mom just fully nixed the entire wedding ceremony and just, I don't know, went out to the Cheesecake Factory by herself and decided not to attend. And then after the wedding, her and Chris's sister would just start their new favorite game of talking shit about Shanann. I don't know what happened there. The biggest speculation is just a conflict of personalities and he was the baby. And so she's pulling the baby away from his mom. They had a super good relationship. So it kind of seemed like one of those vibes where she was just the other woman, which is so creepy to say about a mom and daughter-in-law, but a lot of moms seem to feel that way. I'm not a mom, so I'm not judging. I'm just saying. But the point is, is that their relationship actually would come up later. And people have speculated that that could have been maybe a breaking point for Chris when Shanann and his mom go head to head in 2018. So just hold on to that, okay? We'll get there, I promise. That same year, Chris and Shanann had taken a trip to Colorado for whatever reason, and they both fell in love with the vibe and the atmosphere and, you know, the weather. I moved to Colorado after meeting a friend of mine in North Carolina. Um, after I nannied for her children, we moved out here after visiting, fell in love with the area. It's gorgeous in Colorado. We created a life for ourselves out here and we love it here. We've we've made such an amazing um, group of friends that we call family, fa friends that are closer to us than some family, um, friends who are there for us better than some family. They both got a job at one of those Ford dealerships in Frederick, found a big ass five bedroom house and planted their roots. Pretty quickly after the move on December 17th, 2013, they welcomed their first daughter into the world, Bella. And then on July 17th, 2015, like exactly two years and a month later, they welcomed Cece or Celeste, their youngest baby. Oh my gosh. Who's that? Is that Cece? Oh my gosh. Oh my She's beautiful. <laughs> she looks shocked. Say hi. Oh, oh good job, Bella. Yes, good so job. Can you give her a kiss? Oh, oh good girl. Oh. Give me a picture of that. I, I'm, I'm recording it. Oh, you want to hold her? Oh my goodness. Good Just a side note, July of 2015 also seemed to be a fairly eventful month. It was kind of like a peaks and valleys in the Watts family, it seems like, because on the bright side, Chris was able to leave his job at Ford and work with Anadarko Petroleum, being some sort of field operator. Chris found an amazing job that's fully um, takes care of him. Um, anything he needs, he's there. They appreciate, they respect him, which is huge for any job that you have. And they had Cece. 
but they ran into a fairly significant financial problem and ended up having to file Chapter 7 bankruptcy because they were just about $450. Nope. $450,000 $450,000 in debt. Imagine filing bankruptcy of over $450 into debt. I'd be really bankrupt by now. Now, while Shanann was pregnant with Cece, she had been working at a call center for a children's hospital, and she had started to scale her hours back because she is heavily pregnant. And, uh, you know, pregnancy, lupus, autoimmune diseases, they don't generally mix super duper well. So her hours were very very low. By the time she went on maternity leave, she'd pretty much pieced the hell out of there and decided that it was time to stay at home and be more of a stay-at-home mother vibe. But it seemed like the lifestyle wasn't necessarily sustainable, especially considering after filing bankruptcy, they still had to pay some stuff back. So she ended up getting a job for an MLM called Lavelle. You know, I don't have any previous network marketing experience, um, so, but I have done some research and the comp plan with Lavelle, there's no comparison. There's no fees for our website. There's no startup fees that you have to, you know, buy into. Um, everything's completely free and the products themselves, they sell themselves. This business model is simple, but it's not easy. So an MLM is basically a pyramid scheme. You have the top bitch, that bitch recruits two more bitches, so on and so forth. Every time you recruit somebody, you make money. You know, there are more eloquent speakers on the topic on this platform. My two favorite being Kiki Chanel and Cruel World Happy Mind. So if you're curious about the intricacies of MLMs, definitely go check them out. But it's basically, it's a pyramid scheme a la LuLaRoe, Avon, Beachbody. Apparently, they rebrand it. To body. Those hey girlies girls. So Shanann plunged headfirst into the girl boss lifestyle and she was doing really freaking well pretty quickly. So they were selling those thrive patches on her social media. You'll see her flexing those on her arm a lot. Can't really speak for the efficacy of the thrive patches, but Shanann and Chris seem to be doing great on them. I'm not knocking them. I've never tried them. If you've tried them, you let me know down below. Are they actually worth it? Either way, she was constantly plugging that, constantly recruiting, and by extent, constantly online. In fact, she was doing so well that her company actually bought her one of those like company leased Lexuses and they sent her on a ton of vacations on the company's dime. Shanann was straight up killing it, dude. Mm. Side note, look. I have a glass straw and I'm very excited about it. So like I said, in order to get that bag, sis, she was constantly online promoting the product, promoting her general lifestyle, talking about how wonderful it was to be a girl boss, working for herself, being able to travel and vacation and take care of her girls while sustaining the family as well. I just kind of wanted to share some things with you guys and um, just touch the base on some things that are going on with Lavelle and with me and uh, kind of see what you guys are... Um if you guys are interested and I have an opportunity for you guys and the thing is is my whole thing this morning is what if what if you tried Thrive and it made you feel amazing what if you tried it and it changed your life I, I love the fact that I have so many people underneath me or with me um should I say that want to better themselves and better their life and better their children's lives and their, their families' lives and Lavelle has that opportunity you can do that I know that sounds absolutely absurd and crazy and there's no company out there that can do that for you um but Thrive does. Like Lavelle, the company itself is a family. And I've been with so many different direct sales companies before and none of them ever follow through in helping you. Um, it's kind of like, hey, sign up, do this, and there you go, have fun. Here, we are a family. We literally work hand in hand every day with you. Um, and you know, it's, it's not like that here. My leaders work with me on a daily basis and they help me every day. Not only do they help me with my business, but they also help me grow as an individual. I've really grown in the last, um, I would say, you know, with Lavelle for nine months, but I've grown in the last six tremendously with Lavelle. And um, as a person, I feel like I'm a better mom because of my leadership skills that I've learned, um, how to be more confident in myself, how to be um, empowering, like encouraging. I've always been that person who's always wanted to help other people and to make people feel better and to be that encourage, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, to encourage people, like, you know, to make someone better. But I've actually made a difference in the last six months, or I feel like I've made a difference in a lot of people's lives. And people, like, even people that are uh, on my team have made me a better person, um, have helped me grow as an individual, which is truly amazing. 
This is the point in the video where we're gonna be hopping to and from time space. So buckle in, I already told you to grab a blanket and a friend. So uh, I will try to keep it simple. So on June 11th, 2018, Shanann posted a pregnancy announcement video and documented Chris's reaction to the baby. <laughs> I like that shirt. Really? Really. That's awesome. So pink means... That's just the test. I know. It's just says the pink is going to be girls. I don't know. Just the test. That's awesome. Guess, uh, guess, guess when you want to, it happens. Wow. This is the first time that I had actually ever heard about this, and I was so confused as to why some random ass family's pregnancy announcement was all over my Facebook feed. This is why it turns out, oopsies. After the announcement, it was announced that they were going to name the baby Nico. All in all, June of that year seemed to be kind of a good time for them. They seemed to be at a bit of a high. And Shanann was posting just these cute little videos, like this one of Bella singing a song about how much she loves her dad. It's so cute. And then on Father's Day, Shanam posted a super sweet tribute to Chris on just social media, which is really fun because plot twist, Chris had a mistress. We're just going to drop that little bit of information in right here. Her name is Nicole Kessinger. And uh, on that day, Chris was telling Nicole that he was actually planning on divorcing his wife. Meanwhile, Shanann's out here like, oh my God, I love my husband and so do my babies and thanks for being such a stand-up guy. Super ironic and super sad. But once the excitement of this new pregnancy started to deteriorate, things went downhill fairly quickly. For example, there's this text conversation where Shanann's basically like, um, what's going on, Christopher? Why aren't you talking to me? And the only time you ever actually get emotional is when I sit there and dig it out of you. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm chilling. Um, work's just been really hard. So sorry. Love you to the moon and back. Kisses. So as things are going from bad to worse, Chris is like, okay, you need a vacation. I need you to get the hell out of the house. So why don't you go to North Carolina? Shanann's like, hell yeah. So she takes the girls back home to hang out with her family and Chris's family. So that way they can both decompress. And the idea was, okay, when she comes home, let's see how Chris is feeling. Chris wanted to know if he was still feeling that compatibility and spark that they'd initially felt and that he was currently feeling with his mistress, although he wasn't about to tell her that. And uh, they would reassess when she got home. While Shanann was away, there was an incident called the tree nut incident or nutgate as a lot of people refer to it. It's really intense and uh, fairly long winded. So let's just hop into it. I was originally going to read through everything, but I actually decided that I'm not going to be doing that because wow, it's a lot. So we're just going to summarize here. So basically it starts on July 9th when Shanann posted on Facebook that she was just here to vent and that she was super pissed off because her mother-in-law had basically tried to murder her child from <laughs> Shanann perspective. Cece had a severe nut allergy. Chris's mom knew this. Shanann had asked Chris's mom to remove all nut-based products from the house. Chris's mom said, yeah, okay, for sure. So Shanann sent over the list of pre-approved foods, making life super duper easy for Chris's mom. For whatever reason, Chris's mom was like, actually, you can go fuck yourself bought ice cream that had nuts in it. And while Cece and the fam were at her house, 
one of the other granddaughters who were there went to the fridge, grabbed the ice cream cone, and started just mowing through it in front of the girls. It's not her fault. I mean, she's a little kid too, so I don't blame her. I do blame Chris's mom for even buying that and introducing it into the household. Like, you truly couldn't have just waited or gotten vanilla. Like, let's let's use our brains here, ma'am. It's super weird. Kind of f***ed up. So naturally, Shanann's pissed. Chris's mom is like, well, Cece has to learn that, you know, she has to be patient. She can't just get everything she wants, which is super f***ed up because she's a kid and could have easily just reached over and like yoinked a chunk for herself because she's a kid. She was like two and a half at this point. So yeah, impulse control is not really on the radar for a two and a half year old, but I digress. The long and short of it is Chris's mom, in my opinion, f***ed up in a big way. Shanann got pissed. Also up in a big way by dragging her dirty laundry and airing it all over Facebook. That wasn't super chill of her, but you know, what's done is done. So the root of the problem, Chris's mom, Shanann did not f***ing help in the slightest. Out of frustration, Shanann was like, um, no, we're actually not going to hang out with the family anymore. It's uh, the Ruzik family or nothing. Watts can go to hell. We're not hanging out with them. To which Chris is super upset. And I can understand that. It's hard because I do see both sides where it's like, okay, your mom straight up bought tree nut based things and food around our child who's severely allergic to tree nuts. Why would she do that? Why couldn't she just wait? What the hell is wrong with her? But again... The reaction maybe wasn't the most mature. It might have been a little bit of an overshoot on Shanann's part. I'm just saying, outside her perspective, maybe both needed to go take a few deep cleansing breaths. So anyway, yeah, Shanann's like, okay, I really don't want to have contact with these folk anymore. Chris obviously wasn't on board for this, but he was kind of Shanann's bitch for a long time. So she seemed like she could really convince him to do just about anything she wanted. So basically, Shanann drags Chris into the middle and is like, you need to straighten this shit out. Go talk to your dad to talk to your mom about why the hell she decided to try and murder her granddaughter. This is unacceptable. Chris at that point was like, yeah, 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 I get it. That makes sense. Fair point. It was f***ed up. Let me go talk to my mom. So for a while, it kind of seemed like, okay, they're on the same page. Chris obviously doesn't want to lose contact with his family or lose his baby's ability to see their grandparents. Where is she? She's right there. Go give her a hug. Go give her a hug. So he's really just trying to smooth it over. Maybe shit will calm down after Shanann and his mom can just take a cold shower. Now remember, we're in the dead of summer. Who was born in summer? Baby Cece. They planned this big family birthday party because they were all in the same state. So they invited both Shanann and Chris's parents' side. And they were all supposed to just meet up, have this big thing. Chris was supposed to be in town. It was going to be a really good day until Nutgate came along and messed everything up. So the long and short of that is that after Shanann and posted this maybe a little aggressive, slightly tone deaf Facebook post. Her mother-in-law was like, okay, well then I'm just simply not going to go. So she also got passive aggressive, decided to peace out on Cece's birthday and was, it seemed like basically thinking, okay, I'm not welcome. So I'm just going to sit this one out. And then Chris's dad, he was like, yeah, no. So now this really just released a whole lot of demons for Shanann. And she sent Chris the world's longest messages. And the long and short of those are, hey, what the hell? Why have you been so negligent toward me and the kids while I'm gone? I haven't really heard from you. And also, super cool that you're letting your parents get away with this. It's just our daughter's life in the line. No big deal. Who needs her? So like, she was pissed. I would say fairly rightfully so. But you know... Chris was a little preoccupied back home, sticking his dick where it didn't belong. Unbeknownst to Shanann, he was wrapped around the finger of a woman named Nicole Kessinger. Nicole was his coworker, and during that time, she seemed to be doing a fair amount of Sherlock Holmesing on Chris and his wife and family, according to the Discovery, the 2000-page Discovery that was published. She was searching up. 
Chris and Shanann a lot and kind of cyber stalking Shanann. She was obsessed with Chris. She ended up getting Chris a few days after Shanann left. She was all up in his business and he was totally chill with it, adding her number to his phone and like sending and receiving sexy snaps and just being really lovey-dovey with each other. For a while, she didn't know he was married, allegedly, because he wasn't wearing his ring to work. But I mean, with the amount of Facebook stalking, it's a little hard not to you know, put the pieces together. Either her old brain's not as hard and firm as it should be, or she's lying and full of shit. Choose your own adventure. So Nicole's out here just being messy as hell, sending her pictures. Oh God, leaving the world's most annoying voicemails. I almost forgot to mention. Hi. (laughs) It's me. I miss your face. I was just calling to say hi. Call me back. Bye. Hi. (laughs) It's me. The way she giggles makes my skin crawl and makes my teeth straight up water. (gasps) But she was so f***ing messy. She was looking up the Amber Frey case. So Amber Frey was the woman who Scott Peterson cheated on when his wife, Lacey Peterson, went missing and then was murdered. She actually was kind of a gem about it. She immediately came forward when she figured out that he was married. She thought he wasn't. It was a whole thing. We'll go into it in another episode. But the point is, is she handled herself with such grace and was just completely forthcoming with officers about everything, like not really hiding anything that could be specifically determined. Whereas Nicole is just kind of full of shit left, right, and center. So she's out here Googling how much is Amber Frey worth? How much did she make off her book deal? Do people hate Amber Frey? Like, she is really kind of comparing herself and putting herself on this pedestal that uh, I don't think she necessarily belongs on, but to each their own, I guess, if that's what she feels, go off, sis. She was also searching stuff like wedding dresses, man I'm having an affair with says he'll leave his wife, how to prepare for anal sex, the anal sex guide, and was super into looking at P-O-R-N of threesomes. I mean, the last few... Who cares? Maybe she'll do and butt stuff with him or anyone else. Like, I don't really care about the sex life stuff. I just thought it was super interesting to bring up. And she's on the internet a lot, looking up a lot of really interesting shit that I just wanted to mention. Nicole and Chris were pretty much constantly in daily communication with each other, going on dates a lot. They went to the sand dunes together and spent the night at a nearby campsite. Thank you so much for coming out here with me, Christopher. I am having a wonderful time. You mean a lot to me. And I'm glad that you're having a blast. I am so out of breath. (laughs) Meanwhile, Shanann's trying to call Chris and he's just ignoring her. Luckily for Shanann, unluckily for Chris, he up in a big way. He told Shanann that he was going to go out with co-workers to a Rockies game and then go get dinner, whatever, no big deal. Well, this little dumbass, he went to a fairly expensive bar and grill, spent $63, and then when Shanann was like, hey, what the hell? He was like, um, I was just so hungry and I wanted some steaks, but like the fancy ones? Also wine and, you know, treat yourself. Mental health. It's all good. Shut up. But she's not an idiot. And at this point, she was already fairly suspicious that he was having an affair. And this pretty much put the nail in the coffin for Shanann. From this point moving forward, it seems like she was 100% convinced that he was cheating on her. Now that we have all this backstory, let's shift gears back to the Watts family home. We're on August 7th, 2018. This is about a week before the main event in this case went down. So Shanann's having this text conversation with her friend. She's basically venting her frustration about Chris seemingly getting cold feet about the baby. In fact, when they had gone to the ultrasound together to reveal the gender to them, so that way they could later have an already announced gender reveal party, he was super cold and weird and distant. And so Shanann publicly was like, well, f*** this. I'm going to just cancel the party. So she did. And then her friend messages her and she's like, um, hey, girly pop, what are, you, what are you doing? When's the party? Why is it no longer in my social calendar? What's going on? God bless her friend, though, because her friend's like, girl, he's just... He's nervous. It's a third baby. Shanann's like, dude, I think he's cheating on me. And she's like, 
So anyway, he's just nervous. Like, God bless this friend. She really was trying to help. I feel like this friend just assumed it was hormones. Because she was like, Chris wouldn't do that to you. What are you talking about? Like, he's a good guy. He would never cheat on you. Meanwhile, turns out, not a good guy would totally cheat on her. For the next few days, things were a little up and down. Like at one point, Shanann texted her friend and said, oh, we had the best talk ever. But then a few days later, after they had come home from North Carolina to Colorado and Shanann had to leave again for a Lavelle trip to Arizona, she was super morose. Like her friends basically had to force her to eat and laugh and have a genuinely reasonable time because she was just not having it. So I don't know, I guess the good feelings didn't really necessarily last that long. After this big trip, I guess Yes. Some time away without the kids seemed to have brought her some clarity, just being with the girls, hanging out. And she came up with this big speech that she planned on delivering to Chris. So she writes it down, sends it off to her friend, and it's pretty intense. The speech, poor Shanann just seemed to be really grasping at straws, trying to make this work. Meanwhile, Chris, I don't think could care less if he tried. Truly. Meanwhile, Christopher is over here acting like a total turd at work. According to his coworkers, he's just being a demon to the contractors who are coming in. His coworkers, he has a super short fuse, which is completely unlike him because up until this point, he had been very cool, calm, collected. He was chilling. He was easily approachable, according to coworkers. But now, yeah, he's just being a bit of a demon and everyone's like, okay, chill, dude. We're just trying to get her job done just like you. Fucking relax. And he didn't really seem to want to go home. The boys would go out to the bar after work and he would like shut it down. He'd be the last of his group to leave. The first to suggest they should go out. Meanwhile, all of his friends were like, well, we actually love our wife and kids. So we're going to go ahead and head out. And he's like, okay, well, bye. Catch you on the flippity flip. I'm not leaving. Now we have this perfect storm of emotions spiraling so freaking quickly. And it all came to a head in the most grotesque, abhorrent way possible on the morning of October 13th. 2018. So around 1.48 a.m., a neighbor's surveillance camera catches Shanann being dropped off from her trip to Arizona by her friend Nikki. There's Nikki, who's the good guy, and Nicole, who's a little shit. So I'm gonna call Nicole by her full name. She is Nicole. Nikki is like girly pop fun time. We love her. As with any story, there's two sides. So we're gonna start with the original story as told by Chris. And then we're gonna get into the truth a little later. So hold on. So according to Chris, that morning, Shanann had come home from her trip to Arizona and she had immediately confronted him. She's like, why are you being a little hoe? And he's like, because I don't love you anymore. And I want a divorce. And she was like, whoa, fuck. <laughs> Not expected. Allegedly, they just like got in this big ass fight and then went to bed. So you're supposed to get home at like 11. She got home at like 148. She got in bed about two. It wasn't, it wasn't like an argument. We had an emotional conversation, but I'll leave it at that. Easy peasy cash. No big deal. But like kind of a big deal. He just kind of glosses over it for a while. Then later at around 5.15 a.m., Chris heads off to work and spends a normal day at work texting his girlfriend, Nicole, about how his family's quote unquote gone at around like 3.30, almost four that evening, which she thought was kind of weird, but okay. Nary a care in the world. Like he's being a little shady, but normal enough to where at this point, there are no alarm bells. He also spent some time calling his daughter's school Primrose and basically told them that he was going to unenroll them and that they were no longer planning on attending there. And he followed up with his real estate agent telling her, oh, we're looking to downsize. And he's going through this group chat that has him, Shanann, and the realtor in it. And the realtor's like, hey, Shanann, you wanna go ahead and pipe in here? Crickets, nothing. And Chris is like, oh, she hasn't been around all day. It's super weird. Anyway, keep it moving. Smaller house. Let's go, girl. He says that he tried to call Shanann throughout the day and she wasn't answering. And so how many times did you try calling her? I called her three times, texted her about three times just to say, you know, what's going on? Like, I did, I could, after that, after the, after I called her and texted her once, it was like, I, Maybe she was just busy. Like, it, she just got back, you know, like everybody's probably calling her from her trip. She just got back from Arizona. And I figured just she was just busy. He also was telling everybody that she had gone on a play date. So she's busy. She's not going to answer. It's fine. But bad bitch Nikki Atkinson, the one who dropped her off in the morning and was also BFFs with Shanann, was clearly a lot more concerned by her silence than her husband was. Because Christopher couldn't care less. 
Nikki was like, what the hell's happening? So she marches her little butt cheeks over to the Watts household, rings the doorbell, and was like, I'm hi, Shanann, what the hell? She sees Shanann's car in the driveway. The girl's car seats are still in the car. So she's like, all right, lie number one, she is not gone. She did not leave the house without the car and the car seats. She texted Shanann, quote, I've been to your house. You won't open the door. Your alarm is set. Your shoes are sitting inside. Your car is home. I am so very concerned about you right now. I need you to text me or call me and just tell me, okay. If you don't want to talk to nobody, you don't want to be around nobody. I get it. It's fine, but I need to know you're okay, unquote. So she's ringing this doorbell camera. It's one that Chris can talk through. So he's talking to her. And is like, can you fucking not? They're fine. She's like, no, Christopher, they're not. Here's the evidence as to why they're not. Stop lying. What's happening? So she's super suspicious. And uh, he's like, well, shit, maybe it's time to go home and act like something's up. So he leaves work, goes home, and immediately gets into doting dad mode. At this point... The cops are there. Nikki. Wasn't farting around and she had already called them. Once Chris gets home, he lets the cops in. They wander around trying to find any sort of clues as to the whereabouts of Shanann and the girls. And they find Shanann's purse by like the foot of the stairs. They see Cece's EpiPen. They find Shanann's cell phone, which is glued to her in between the couch cushions. It just looks suspicious as hell to everyone but Chris seems very clear that she's gone and not by her own volition so one of the neighbors was like dude I can help I have this uh security camera and I bet you we can see what happened because the camera faced toward the Watts driveway they go over to the neighbor's house he puts on the surveillance video and they all stand around and watch. Chris must be shitting his pants because he didn't seem to realize that this neighbor had this camera that faced their house. So he's just standing there like, oh, wow, thanks, friend. What's that? Nothing on there. You just have to my camera. Lay down. I'm going to my stuff up in my coolers, my water jugs, my book bag, my computers. Some of the tools that I had from the toolbox. I knew I was going to have to do some pumping, pumping into rubbers today. So I was out so far. Now is this on con- continually? Yep. Recording. Yep. Well, it's mo- not. Is it motion, motion or is event. it? Okay, so it's motion. Any motion event that happens, I got. But I get cars driving from this street, from this street. And this is him at 517. <laughs> My detective just showed up, um, so he'll probably want to talk to you. He'd probably, like I said, he might have you call at the bank and see if there's any kind of activity. Because if there is any sort of action out there, his camera, like, I would have got it. Like right. had, I had, we had issues the other other week when people were coming, were stealing stuff out of like garages and stuff like that. And I have parked my truck. I right have here. park right here. Yeah. So someone, see if I can see where someone tried to jimmy with a flathead screwdriver over there, and it was just like. But if any action would have happened, any cars or anything left yeah. your house, I would have yeah, been like right in that area. It should have picked, I mean, like oh, it'll pick up anything coming down the street this way. You know that trigger Oh, yeah. Okay. Watch, I'll show you. There's nothing on here. We've already watched that one. But, like, you'll see this car. You can see this car starting to drive down the street. Here. Right one. Oh, look. See what That's I'm cool. saying? It picks yeah. up all the way down there. Because, yeah, we can pick up cars coming this way. I get anything coming this way and make it so, and usually at night I pick up the car for a year turn. So, unless they pulled right here, yeah. but I would have caught her walking out. Diesel. So yeah, I thought nothing. Nothing for the rest of the day. No, that's it. And see, I've got her friend leaving out here at Two in the morning, I think, because she, she dropped her off at one in the morning, right? 
Uh, she's that my doorbell said 148. She came in. Okay. So as soon as it picks up motion, it like fails. Okay. I thought she. That was the start of the video. Yep. Uh, 148 in the morning. I didn't pick her up going into the house though. It didn't. And I usually pick him up when he comes walking through here. Mm -hmm. I pick him up. So it doesn't show her walking into the house. Or she would have walked by when this on. But this is at 148, and then the next one I have is in yeah. five, whatever. So nothing, nice. no cars came through because I guarantee with the headlights, it picked up the headlights oh, yeah. automatically. And my vivid said that at 527, my garage door was left open, but that could have been the sensor as well. It says it was shut during the day, but I think when Nikki's uh, son, he may have tried to move the, the, sit the door around, maybe when they were trying to get in the door, in the garage right. door, and if I broke the, the laser there. That's because this, my alarm started going off. Well, I know he said the front door he tried going in, but he had the lock yeah, up. That's, that's for so the that kids, set so it off, out. right? And our remote on the outside doesn't work anymore. It got wet and it's the whole radio on the back. So, yeah, that was it. Okay. All right, appreciate your time. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Hopefully something comes up here. Yeah. Matter of fact, you just want to go talk to him. I'm going to get his info real quick. You can clearly see that Chris, who is not allowed to park his car in the driveway, his company truck, because it leaks like crazy and Shanann hates that shit. You can see him pull it into the driveway, load something into it, and then leave super early in the morning. Red flags going up everywhere. Later on August 14th, Shanann and the girls still aren't home. So Chris does the world's most uncomfortable public plea for help for Denver 7 that I've seen in a hot minute. Like he's kind of giggling. I'm like, huh, can you like stop being a silly goose and just bring my family home? Oh my God, I miss them and stuff. Uh, Chris Watt. What, what's going on right now around your house? Right now it's got canine units, the sheriff's department. Everybody's like, they're, they're doing their best right now to figure out like if they can get a scent, see where they went. If they went on foot, they went. In a car, they went somewhere, and right now it's just like they've they've been on point. They're going through the house trying to get a scent, and hopefully they can pick something up to where it's it's going to lead to something. As she like she came home from the airport 2 a.m. and I left around 5:15. She was still here, and like about 12:10 in that afternoon, her friend Nicole showed up at the door. Nicole called me when she was at the door, and that's when I came home. And then walked in the house and nothing has vanished. Nothing was here. I mean, she wasn't she wasn't here. The kids weren't here. No, nobody was here. When her friend showed up, that's what it was like. It, it registered like, all right, this isn't right. Do you think she just took off? Do you think? I, I mean, right now, I don't even want to just like throw anything out there. Like, I hope that she's somewhere safe right now and with the kids. But I mean, could she have been, could she have just taken off? I don't know, but if, somebody has her and they're not safe like I want them back now like that that that's what's in my head like if they're safe right now they're gonna come back but if they're not safe right now that's what that's the not knowing part like if they're not safe I, I, last night I was I had every light in the house on I was hoping that I would just get just ran over by the kids running in the door and just like barrel rushing me but it didn't happen and it was just a traumatic night 
trying to be here. I mean, I mean yeah, my, my kids are my life. I mean, those those smiles light up my life. And there's like, I mean, last night, like, during like, at, you know, when they usually eat dinner, it was just like, I miss them. Like, I mean, I miss telling them, hey, you gotta eat that or you're not gonna get your dessert, you know? And just like, you're not gonna get your snack after. I, I miss that. Like, I, I miss them, you know, cuddle up on their couches. They have like a Minnie Mouse couch and a Sophia couch that they cuddle up on and watch, you know, Bubba Guppies or something. And it was just like, you know, I mean, I, I, I was, it was tearing, tearing me apart last night and I needed that. I needed that last night. And for that, for nobody to be here last night and to go into their rooms and not, and know that I wasn't going to turn the rain machines on. And I know that I wasn't going to turn their monitor on. I know I wasn't going to kiss them to bed tonight. It was, it, it was, I, I, that's why last night was just horrible. I couldn't do it. it I just, I just want, I want everybody to just come home. Like wherever they're at, come home. That's what I want. I just, I just want them to come back. And if, if they're not safe right now, that's what's, that's what's tearing me apart. Because if they are safe, they're coming back. But if they're not, this, this, this has got to stop. Like somebody has to come forward. That first day I was like, I want to get out and drive around. Shannon, Bella, Celeste, if you're out there, just, just, just come back. Like if somebody has her, just please bring her back. I need to see everybody. I need to see everybody again. This house is not complete with, without anybody here. Please bring her back. He's just so weird about it. All that interview really did was raise more suspicions toward Chris. And at this point, everyone's like, ooh, we think we can really piece together what happened here. August 15th, the FBI joins the search because Nicole gets involved and is like, hey, we were bumping uglies, oopsies, and comes forward and pretty much rats everything that she and Chris were doing out. Now the FBI is like, ring, ring, Christopher. Hi, we need you down here, stat. And he's like, perfect, yes. The thing is, my dad's coming into town for like, you know, moral support and stuff. So I'm gonna go get him and then I'll reconvene back here, okay? So he gets his dad, goes to the police station for their interview and polygraph test. He fails abysmally on the polygraph test. So I brought Graham in here because we want to talk to you about the results, okay? Sure. So, um, it is completely clear that you were not honest during the testing, and I think you already know that. Um, he did not pass the polygraph test. Okay. Okay. So now we need to talk about what actually happened. I feel like you're probably ready to do that. Uh, I didn't. I didn't lie to you on that polygraph. I promise. Chris, I, I'm. I'm. I'm not stop. Stop. I. Just stop for a minute. Take a deep breath. I. I want you to take a deep breath right now. He screwed the pooch in a big old way with that. And he was so confident too. He's like, oh, yeah, it's fine. I can take that. I didn't murder my family. Okay, Chris. After Chris absolutely bombs his polygraph test, he's sweating. He's getting nervous. And the FBI is like, dude, we know you're lying. You're not sneaky. Sorry. So he's like, well, fuck. Can I talk to my dad? And they're like, oh. Yeah, for sure he is, because they can see he's about to break. So they send his dad in. And uh, at this point, one of the investigators had already kind of given him an out. And they were like, Chris, baby, did Shanann make you do it? Did you snap? Because Shanann was killing the kids. It's okay. We just need to know. So he doesn't really say anything in the moment. And then his dad comes in and he goes, dad, Shanann killed the kids. It wasn't my fault. I was defending them. Like, it was a whole thing. I don't want to protect her. What? I don't want to protect her. I didn't hear anything. No, I was about to go to the king 
back up. They're gone. I don't know, like, we talk, 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 I'm talking to her about that. I'm talk, talk, talking to her about separation and everything about, like, she lost her. I don't know, like, what else to say, like, The way he immediately just crumbled and then blamed Shanann is sick. But a bullshit confession is still a confession, so he's arrested on suspicion of three first-degree murder charges and three charges of tampering with a deceased human body. The next day, on August 16th, Chris finally nuts up and tells everybody where the bodies are, and police quickly rush to Anadarko Petroleum site and find both Bella and Cece shoved into one of the oil tanks, and Shanann just haphazardly thrown into a hole, but up, because he just threw her in head first. He did not care. The site was about 40 miles east of their house, and it was something that Chris was fairly familiar with, so it was kind of obvious afterward that's where he would go ahead and dump the bodies. Once Chris went to court, bail was immediately denied, thank God, and he refused to enter to plea, having already admitted to the authorities that he had strangled Shanann in a fit of rage and disposed of all three bodies, so he was guilty, whether he liked it or not, or wanted to plead to it. He was screwed. Things went pretty quick, and then on August 21st, 2018, he was charged with three counts of first-degree murder, plus two counts of murder of a child younger than 12 while, quote, in a position of trust, unquote. He also got the three counts of tampering with a deceased human body and unlawful termination of a pregnancy, because obviously, if we recall, Shanann was pregnant with Nico. That pregnancy ended when her life ended. In order to avoid the death penalty on November 6, 2018, Chris pled guilty and was sentenced to a life sentence in prison five times over. He was ultimately sentenced on November 19th to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Fast forward a year and Chris is finally ready to fully confess to all the shit that he did to the family and this is graphic. If you are easily uh, triggered and are super sensitive to harm caused to a child or a pregnant lady or just murder in general in a more graphic sense, please click away. It's all good, dude. I get it. Normally my videos aren't super graphic, 
This one is just so heinous and he was so full of shit for so long that I hadn't seen a lot of creators cover just the brute force and disgusting actions Chris took. And I wanted to get into it just to fully show what a shithead this man is. So again, I get it. This is definitely off the beaten path that we usually take on Creeps and Creeps. Love ya. See you in the next video. But for those of you who are sticking around, let's just get right into it. So in 2019, Agent Coder and his partner, who had gotten the confession out of him back in 2018, they weren't happy with what he had provided. They were like, you're full of shit and we know it. We need a real confession. So they went and visited him and basically demanded to be told in no uncertain terms that Shanann did not harm her children. And this was all Chris was doing. They knew that he was clearly full of it. And in conjunction with the letters that he had been sending to a woman who wanted to write a book about him, it seems like we may finally have a a truthful order of operations that Chris took that night. So he says that the night before the murders on August 12th, he had said goodnight to the girls and thought, quote, that's the last time I'm going to be tucking my babies in, unquote. He had fully planned this. It had nothing to do with Shanann, other than him just being a greedy little bastard who wanted out of his marriage. So the morning of August 13th rolls around and Shanann had gotten home, but before their fight, he says that he had gone into the girls' room, taken each of their pillows, and smothered them both. He says he then went back into his room, got into the fight with Shanann, and then crawled on top of her and strangled her so aggressively that blood pooled in her eyes, and he said that he knew that she was dead because she quote-unquote relieved herself. Somehow both girls had managed to survive their father's attack and they had just basically passed out and they came into their parents' room to see what the hell was happening because, you know, they can hear their parents fighting. Chris said, quote, Bella's eyes were bruised and both girls looked like they had been through trauma. That made the act that much worse, unquote. Then he wrapped Shanann in their bedsheet, grabbed her corpse, and dragged her to the truck. Meanwhile, both girls were bruised and crying, unsure why their mommy was so still. Chris said that he tried to reassure him and just was like, oh, she's unwell. He then drove himself, his dead wife, and his daughters to the remote oil field where he dumped her body in a shallow grave. He says that he tossed her body face first into the hole, which forced her to partially give birth to baby Nico who at this point is obviously already deceased. But Chris, being the absolute fucking monster he is, said that she, quote, landed face down. I remember being so angry with her that I was not going to change how she landed, unquote. After dumping Shanann's body, he walked back to the truck where Cece and Bella were watching this unfold. He said that he took the blanket that Cece was clutching onto, held it over her head, and smothered her, and this time was successful. He says that he shoved her body through this eight inch tiny hatch on one of the tankers saying, quote, I couldn't believe how easily it was to just let her drop through the hole and let her go, unquote. Then he went back to the truck to smother poor Bella who had witnessed everything. He says that she was the only one who really fought back so aggressively, which shocked him because she was just like him, he says, and was normally a lot more subdued. She looked him dead in the eye and says, quote, is the same thing going to happen to me as he throw her body unquote. in the eight inch opening on the oil tank as well? Okay, let's take a cleansing breath, everybody. We're very close to the end, so. <sighs> All right. These days, he says that he keeps photos of his late wife and children in his cell and talks to them every morning and night, which is just like the f-ing audacity of this creature. He murders them and is like, oops my bad. Sorry, I was just like super in love and stuff. He almost says this, in my opinion, as if it's supposed to buy him brownie points. In my perspective, the way he talks about it is very much like, well, I keep their picture and I'm like super sorry and stuff. So it's fine. Like it's not fine, but don't be mad at me. Okay. I don't know. I just, I don't like this guy. He's a little shit. What he did was abhorrent. And I don't think he deserves to even have pictures of them up. If for any reason other than to feel like shit looking at them. If he feels anything but like shit, take the pictures down. You evil little bastard. And then... Because this is a creature who refuses to take any sort of accountability, he has the absolute balls 
to blame this on Nicole. He says that had he not met her, he wouldn't have done this. This is her bad for having met him and seduced him. He said that after the murders, quote, all I could feel was now I was free to be with Nikki. Feelings of my love for her were overcoming me. I felt no remorse, unquote. But then still had the audacity to be like, but also it's her fault, so. <laughs> he also claimed that he was so obsessed with Nicole that he had already tried to force Shanann to miscarry the baby by secretly giving her oxycodone, which if you don't know, is like, a super powerful painkiller that's extremely addictive and also extremely dangerous to pregnant people. And he only did this because he said that Nicole said that she wanted to be the one to give him his first son. So to wrap it up, Chris is a dumb bitch. He murdered his family because he wanted to have his first baby with Nicole. It's all Nicole's fault. Chris is the victim. We should feel bad for Chris for sure. All he wanted to do was be with Nicole. Divorce isn't an option, for sure. Chris couldn't have just divorced her. Suck it up. But now, the world has to go on without four beautiful people. We never even got to meet Nico. And this absolute shit stain of a man has to spend the rest of his life in prison, as he should, thinking every single day about what a little asshole he is, and I hope it eats him alive. Thank you so much for joining me. If you liked this episode, good. Thank you. Sorry it got a little rough here in the last half, but if you feel so inclined, please subscribe. I'd love to have you here as a permanent fixture on this channel. Leave a comment below. I don't think it was Nicole's fault, but do you think she had any sort of influence in it? Like, what is your perspective on that? I'm not going to blame her. I think that they were both in the wrong, but it's nobody's fault ultimately but his. I'm just gonna leave it there. Like, subscribe, comment. I'm losing my steam here. Got very rattled by this whole tale. Anywho, I hope you have a safe day. Keep your head on a swivel, guys. I'll see you next time. Toodles. <laughs>